I'm going to tell a, a little story that's always been intriguing to me. Um, there's a writer on The Sopranos named Terrence Winter. He regularly writes some of the best episodes. In fact, he just recently wrote and directed the episode where um, the TV writer gets shot at the end of the episode, if anybody <laughs> watched it. You know, Terry is quite a brilliant writer. And when he came out here from the East Coast, he had no connections. He recognized this fact that you sort of need an agent to represent your material. You, you need somebody other than you telling people how great you are. And yet he didn't, he couldn't find that person. No agents wanted to read his material. Uh, he was writing spec scripts of television shows and of movie features like most of us do. But nobody would listen and nobody would pay attention. Terry did, however, have a friend who was a lawyer at a Century City law firm, totally unrelated to the entertainment business. And his friend had an extra office that was empty at the time. And so what Terry did was create letterhead that was basically the Joe Schlobotnik agency. In other words, he created a fake literary agency and with only one client, <laughs> Terry Winter. And so this agent, aggressive, cold calling everywhere in town, Joe Schlobotnik, called everybody, every creative executive in the creative directory handbook and basically said, you have to read the hottest client in the world, Terry Winter. And what Terry did was send out dozens, if not hundreds, of samples of his script and then sat in his, uh, extra, his friend's extra law office where some secretary was instructed when the line rang to say, Joe Schlobotnik agency. <laughs> pass him along to uh, Terry. And Terry would then answer the phone and talk to the development executives. Now, by the way, only half a dozen out of several hundred people even bothered to respond to Schlobotnik or read his client's work. But basically, <laughs> Terry fielded those calls and, uh, and landed a job on a short-lived sitcom called Diresta. Uh, out of these efforts. And, and of course, uh, once he was in the pro game, so to speak, uh, he ended up on The Sopranos and has a stellar career. I, I bring up that point to illustrate that, how do you get in? By any means necessary. <laughs> it's very, very difficult. The friend of a friend of a friend who used to know an agent at Abrams Artist who went to some other agent, that's the guy you have to try to get to. And it's irritating to people who constantly deal with scripts coming their way. They don't want to read your script. And at the same time, you know, you have to just try to figure a way to get your script into the hands of people who ultimately can get it to the people who can get their bosses to buy it. Because, you know, I've sent out lots of scripts and they say, well, I, and, and I, when they tell me they like it, that never means anything to me. I can have 25 people like my script. I need 26 to say, here's the check for it. That's really the only standard of measurement, in my opinion, as to whether they really like it. Very few people tell you they hate your script. Uh, so <clears throat> how do you start? Um, let's, let's, uh, let's, see, let's start down the table with Ellen. And uh, how, how do you suggest a writer break into today's market? Um, well, I actually like to dispel the myth of the big break with my own story. Um, I was a playwright in New York, playwright and director in New York. I worked off off Broadway, little tiny theaters, made no money. That we were lucky if there was a toilet that worked. Uh, and <clears throat> I came out here and did a play in which I, Rhea Perlman played a part. And I had met Rhea back in New York when I was working in these terrible little theaters. She, I was in a, in a play on an off-off-Broadway schedule that was meant we did two shows a day on Saturday and two on Sunday. And they would not let the actors leave the theater for fear that we wouldn't come back, perhaps. I don't know. Uh, but they brought us in bad pizza. And Danny DeVito was in one of the plays in the theater in this theater complex, and I was in another experimental, not commercial, nothing, play. And Rhea would come down and have dinner with Danny, and that's where I met her. That, that was years before I did this little play in Los Angeles, which got me my first job in television. Now, it was a very big break, because Rhea was in the play, Danny, her 
then boyfriend, was uh, starring on Taxi. And he brought Paramount and Jim Brooks down to this play. It was part of a festival. It was a one-act play, part of a one-act play festival. Danny brought them down to see Rhea, because Rhea couldn't get much work as an actress at that time. She got to play Danny's girlfriend a couple of times a year on Taxi. So he brought them down to see Rhea. And then, just like it's supposed to happen in the movies, Jim Brooks, you all know who Jim Brooks is? Mm -hmm. Comedy God? Jim Brooks? OK. Came, in, came up to me at, after the play at the intermission and said, you're great. I want you to write for Taxi. Call me Monday. Now, that's just how it's supposed to happen, isn't it? <laughs> yes. That's a big break, right? That is the big break. But wait a minute. When was my big break? When really was it? Was it back there in New York when I was having bad pizza, just being friends with Rhea? Was it back in college when I dated the guy who got me the audition for the play that I was in? That <laughs> when was my big break? In fact, I didn't get a big break. I got a continuum of a lot of things that I couldn't predict that were going to result in this event. There's a second half of this story that has to, be, has to be talked about. And that is, it wasn't just a break. There were a lot of plays on this, on this uh, same evening. It was a festival, one acts. There were other writers there. None of the other writers got asked by Jim Brooks to call them Monday. They were in the right place at the right time. There, but you have to have both the right place and you have to have some craft. I've been working for 10 years as a writer and director in theater. That play worked. It wasn't my first play. It wasn't a lucky accident. Well, Ellen, that, that uh, reminds me of a statement somebody once made to me, which is that luck is the residue of design. Yeah. In other words, you had been doing the things you needed to do so that when the break, so to speak, happened, it was, the, it was the end result of a lot of, of, of efforts on your part and perseverance. Mm -hmm. And I do think luck is involved, too, um, in, in everything from getting that first opportunity to work for pay all the way to getting your show on a network, et cetera. There, there are a thousand factors that come in, and we cannot discount the fact that, that sometimes just pure dumb luck is involved. Joe, you've been uh, <clears throat> running the lit agency at CAA, which is um, – one of the bigger, if not the biggest, agency in town. You've watched people's careers develop over the 17 years you've been there. Uh, you yourself started as an agent, probably on the lower ranks, and, and now run the department. Um, what, what are some, what's your perspective on the discovery of writers? One thing I also want to make clear to the people listening here is, you know, there are four or five agencies that are considered the biggest, I guess that would be in terms of, you know, the most clients, making the most money, et cetera, the top tier agencies. There are uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of smaller mid-level agencies and small boutique agencies, all of which offer writers at different points in their career um, uh, uh, valuable guidance. And, and so that if you're starting out as a writer, it's, it's generally unlikely that a place like CAA or William Morris or what UTA, one of, the, one of the big three or four agencies, will just automatically pluck you. It's not to say that it doesn't happen, but uh, I just want to make it clear that, that there are uh, numerous representatives in town who are going to be uh, interested in looking at material. And frankly, the top tier uh, agencies are less interested in looking at newbie material than the smaller agencies who make their bread and butter by representing those writers. Uh, and then ultimately, the top tier agencies pluck those clients away. But anyway, uh, anyway, your perspective, I would, I would, Joe. I would add one thing to that. I think that um, in my perspective, having been there, I've been in my company 20 years, um, I'm always looking at new material. Um, I'm most interested in looking at original material. So um, even when I was coming of age as a young literary agent, um, looking to put writers to work, be it the movie of the week business or the series television business, it was always to me more important what their original voice was as opposed to having the perfect spec episode of something. So, and to me that's, the, that's always the barometer that I'm looking at because I'm looking at this business in a long-term perspective. I'm looking at um, what are the things that you can do to differentiate yourself 
and be yourself. Be more of yourself than anybody else could be. Um, and that to me is the, is the fundamental thing I've looked for ever since I just got, I got started and realized that my taste and my interests are things that I'm going to apply to my work. And I'm going to pursue avenues and shows and um, networks and broadcasters to sell to the things that turn me on the most. And I think as a writer, the most important thing, one of the more important things you can do is focus on your voice. Focus on the things that are most pressing to you. What's a leitmotif in your work that's consistent over a long period of time? And um, the first thing about television that people, you may not know, is that we were talking about it briefly earlier, is that the drama business and comedy business are different. That seems obvious. But when you are writing plays and you're writing screenplays, you're writing a spec episode of something, you're not always thinking what it's like to actually be working, what the jobs are like. Often, you know, it, it, working and succeeding in television is a really unusual enterprise in that often you have to have a very specific voice. Your voice has to stand out very, very clearly. But at the same time, what you don't think about is working with a group of people who may be equally as neurotic and damaged <laughs> and, and screwed up and wonderful um, and self-actualized, you have a wildly divergent group of people put into a room to do something very specific. Knock out and break a lot of different stories and expose character and, and write about people trying to connect on a week-to-week -week basis, whether it's comedic or whether it's dramatic. And when you're in a room full of those people, you, it's not always about the writing. So it's, it's, I always say to people, it's a very unusual combination of personality traits that you can think about how to succeed in television, which is also how you break in, which is sometimes you have to be the captain of the football team and the poet laureate. Those are very, very contrasting um, personality types when you're working. It doesn't mean you can't succeed and be a successful writer over a long period of time if you don't have both those characteristics. But I can say from my perspective, what I'm looking for is those, are those two things. Does your personality connect with something unique, and are you able to hang out with people for 42 weeks a year in a room where some people will be critiquing you very carefully and not always honestly. And can you also have such a thick skin that you can push through all that because you believe you do something special. And that special could be you have an incredible aptitude in breaking stories that are crime stories. That you have an unbelievable knack to write pop culture, you know, scatological humor and jokes, rapid fire, and not be deterred when people think, well, that sucks. You know, that's just stupid. That person's an idiot. Which, as a vet, I'm sure could, can, you know, the, the, it ha you get, you get, you get, you, you get, you get, because in, in a comedy writer's room, you just get, you get beat on. Um, so, uh, and not to say in a drama uh, room, depending on how the show is run, you just have to, you have to realize that, you know, the other thing that I look at is, you know, when looking at your voice and what's on the page, okay, not knowing anything about who you are as people, you should be able to have something in your writing, again, consistently, that shows kind of, if they meet you, someone meets you for the first time, they can tell, they can pull something out of that, that material, whether it's a spec episode of, pick your show, uh, you know, the, the Office, that when they meet you for the first time, they'll know based on what you're writing that something about you that someone else couldn't do, which is really challenging. Um, and I think that that's the part that, you know, and the other thing is that I think about is that good television writing often is about mimicking what your creator or showrunner is doing, but at the same time adding something personal to it that is not, that they can't do themselves or haven't thought of themselves, which is also very, very challenging. And I go back and look over the years I've been doing this and think about what, what's turned me on about people that broke in. Um, I've signed and represented people um, over the years who started on shows that, like, like Chris was saying, I work with Terry Winter, so I know that story inside and out. And the thing that Terry Winter did that was unique throughout all of us is that, and it's funny because uh, a week ago is the movie that he wrote, it's a spec screenplay that after all those years was the thing that got him on The Sopranos, okay, was a movie called, I think it was called The Best Man, it's been retitled a number of times, it was made by Michael Sorrenti, Correnti as a film that was not well reviewed and he wasn't that happy with, but it was, a, it was a piece that you could not take Terry Winter out of it. There was no signature that anybody else could have on that piece of material. And it just so happened serendipitously, as, as Alan had mentioned, that the Sopranos was around, they were looking for somebody, and this piece of material was exactly prototypical of what they were looking for because it was unique, it was a coming of age story, and it was about good people going bad and bad people going good. And you know, when you look at those moral ambiguities, this, that particular show at the right time 
and his personality got him on the most desirable job in the entertainment business. And I think that the other thing is that Terry Winter, um, as Chris had, had, had said, is uh, throughout his whole career has been a storyteller. He's a storyteller in how he represented himself. Okay, he's a storyteller in that he, every job he had, he never looked down on. Duresta, Fresh Prince of Bel Air, um, there was another one, the PJs. Every job that he was on, he never he never looked down on it. And there's a lot of people in this in this town who can come in, have a good piece of material, go from job to job off that one piece of material. And you know, the fact is, you get jaded. I'm not working the thing that's cool enough or hot enough. I'm not I'm not being up for Emmys. The guy never ever looked down on anything he was doing, and he was a joy to work with. And you get reward over time, over a long period of time, you can get rewarded if you have a great attitude and you let your creativity push through. Well, I, so, I, I think that's extremely well said, and I know that from my side of the table, when we're getting inundated with scripts to put writers on a show in the once in a blue moon that I get a show picked up, <laughs> um, uh, the, the, a couple of things I ask agents for. I want to see their original scripts, their, their, not, not their rendition of Lost or their Soprano script. And if that's all they have, if I read it, it better be mind-blowingly good. Because I know that David Chase and Terry and those other guys on the show have taken care a lot of the, uh, of the characterization that's necessary to fill out those characters. I want to see what you can do, not how well you can copy somebody else. Because if you can write your own great script that really knocks me out, then I know you can mimic the show that, that, that I'm doing. And the second thing Joe also says that's absolutely correct is we literally sit around, my partner and I, and when we're trying to build what our staff is going to be, uh, you go, oh yeah, Fred never says anything in the room. He'll sit there for three months and the only words that come out of his mouth are his lunch order. <laughs> but when he goes to write his script, he hands you back a script that you can shoot. Okay, I got one slot for the non-talking freak who <laughs> delivers great scripts. Okay, now, <laughs> Sally has dialogue that comes out of her mouth and out of her pen that's so sparkly I could never hope to replicate it. I get jealous every time I read her scenes. Her, her structure is ass backwards, but her scenes and the dialogue, so okay, we need Sally to do the sparkle. You know, and then you build together your staff. There's another guy. There's a guy we had on a show. He couldn't write a script to save his life. Could not write. A, however, what he could do is when when I left the room to do some pro producerial task or separate two actresses from fighting or whatever, this guy could stand up and just take over the room and keep the board where you're breaking your story and discussing what this week's episode or next week's episode is going to look like. This guy could. He was a leader. He could stand up there and generate and get people to, to deliver ideas so that, so that the room would keep going after I left. But uh, you'd know that when his script came, would come in, it would need a lot of rewriting. But he was extremely valuable for that, that process. And that's, that's the way, from a showrunner perspective, that you build your staff. It is, uh, I'll tell you this, the person who doesn't get the job is the you know, cantankerous asshole who pisses everybody off. Because who wants to have that in the room every single day as you work? Um, Bill, why don't you tell us a little bit about your experiences? You started in an entirely different career as a lawyer. Um, you had some familial background in television writing, but but uh, but what? First of all, what inspired you to make a career shift to writing, and then how did you get your first gig? Well, the whole notion of the big break. There was no series of little breaks for me. I got this like absurd big break out of nowhere. <laughs> Um, I'm completely wrong. Which was, <laughs> I was in fact practicing law and I was doing criminal defense work and it was, you know, the, the burnout rate in that field is really high and I was handling a lot of ugly, violent cases. And um, I was thinking about getting out. I wasn't quite sure what to do in college. I guess this bears your point out. In college, I had written like a, a halfway decent NYPD blue that I had never shown anybody. So... Um, a, a former public defender whom I had worked with was now a divorce lawyer, and she was handling the, handling the divorce of a guy who was starting a television show. They wanted a lawyer <laughs> around to give it like an air of authenticity. And so they brought me in. The notion was, and I did make the best of, of this big break, the notion was that I would be a technical consultant on the show. And within a month, I was just like a writer on the show. Like everybody else, I had in fact shown them uh, this 
kind of lame but decent NYPD blue. And, um, and then I was a writer, and, uh, and, and that's kind of how I got started. The law card is an excellent card to play. The, when I first started, it was really excellent. By the time I had been in this business for a few years and I was working on the practice, and I was like, look at me, I'm a lawyer and a writer. And then I looked around the room and, and literally, <laughs> so was the entire staff. Um, but what distinguished me even within that group, and this is sort of my advice to everybody in terms of when they are lucky enough to get a meeting is, is I was in the trenches. I had stories. I had like, like have an interesting story. Even if it's total bullshit, like even if it's your sister's story or something like that. When I was lucky enough to staff a show, which as Chris mentioned, um, lasted for two episodes. <laughs> but it was, it's cool to have had the perspective of both, of being on both sides of that desk. There was a guy, and you know what the bottom line is, I think is, 10% of the writers you're going to see are amazing. 10% of the writers that you're going to see stink. 80% are somewhere grouped in the rest of, the, of that. And so, first of all, like Chris said, a big deal is, um, can I spend 10 hours a day with this person? So, so be nice. Be funny. <laughs> don't, don't feel shy about kissing ass. Just don't be really <laughs> obvious about it. But what I was starting to say is there was a guy, and he happens to be a good writer, too. And he may even be in the top 10%, and he's very successful now. But we sat down, and we started talking. And he said, oh, you know, I was a, um, um, a journalist for Rolling Stone magazine, and I used to travel around with bands and, and cover bands. We didn't talk about my show for another second during the interview. I'm like, tell me about you, too. Tell me about this. Tell me about that. And so then by the end of the thing, I'm like, this is the coolest guy in the world. And I want to like, I want to, now listen, if he had been a rotten writer, he wouldn't have gotten in to the room to begin with. And I, I was going to say, maybe that's why your show only lasted two hours. <laughs> 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 yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You know what? When I started hiring models, <laughs> <laughs> I had taken it too far. But I, I, I told you Naomi Campbell can't write. Right? She was so good in the room, though. But there was. Um, but the last thing I'll say is that you, I think you can analogize that to the script that you write. And I so agree with it, what Joe said. He kept using the word voice. Just find what's, don't say like, hmm, Grey's Anatomy. I sort of disagree with you guys, by the way. I think having a speck of an existing show is useful because at the end of the day, you are, if you're going to work on somebody else's show, be asked to mimic somebody else's vision. And so I do think it's useful. I would personally say have both. Uh, but, I would agree with that. Yeah, uh, I would agree absolutely. with having both. Um, but um, when you're staffing a show, agents send over... I mean, your weekend reading thing, it's just, it's voluminous. And, you know, that's just CAA submissions alone. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there was, um, and so the bottom line is, it better be really good in the first three pages. Don't, fee you, you know, for your spec stuff, it's, I, I don't even mean big. It doesn't have explosions or whatever. Just be really, make me want to read. Because I'm telling you, and people may s not cop to this, but it's true is that like if, if you don't have me by the first three pages, I'm done. Right. And even if you do have me by the first three pages, I'm gonna keep reading in, pro in probably five or 10 page increments. But that first big bang is really, well, really Well, I, I think you're right, and I think we should actually take a step back for a second, because right now we're talking about like what it's like to be staffing. Okay, you know, th that's <laughs> three, four jumps ahead. Because the question right now is, what are the scripts that you're writing that get you in the door in the first place, and I'm going to put the two agents here on the spot in a second. But but um, uh, Bill's talking about writing spec material that grabs attention. Um, one one tip I have is uh, I found that if you're writing an original pilot, um, you, you at least in my instance or my my my, circ my uh, belief system is. Write it as an R-rated thing that actually couldn't be on TV. Go a little dark with it because that, frankly, makes it stand out a little bit. Uh, one of the scripts, you know, after a year writing, years writing for Aaron Spelling and various people who you get paid plenty of dough, but it, you ain't, you know, you ain't writing home. Hey, mom, I just wrote another episode of Hearts Are Wild or, or <laughs> 90210 or something. So. For me, I just sat down and wrote a, a, sh you know, a lot of friends of mine have been drug addicts and died of overdoses and stuff. And I, I wrote a, 
uh, a pilot about about drugs and and uh, called dope uh, it was before traffic and that one script suddenly changed me from being somebody who was viewed as you know this light fluffy I, mean, I, I never even watched most of the stuff that I got paid to write I wasn't interested in it but it was a job and, and so now all of a sudden this dark grittier thing got a lot of attention and suddenly for the first time in my career people were saying oh well maybe he's capable of writing on NYPD Blue at 10 o'clock and that hadn't been the perception of my writing before. Is that what would you say about the first of all the first script or two or the script that got you your foot in the door and 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 I guess your <laughs> break? So, well so to my, it wasn't my script that got me in the door, it was my begging that got me in the door. Um, Basically, I was uh, a senior in college, and I was watching The Cosby Show, and I was kind of having a pity party with a good friend of mine, because I was supposed to be going to law school, and uh, I really didn't want to go. Good and choice. I noticed the name of someone I knew in the credits, and I decided to track that person down. Um, and that person was like the music supervisor on the show. And um, I called him up, and I said, I really think I want to write for television. I know no one in television. I don't have any idea what that means. I, mean, I think most people who watch TV don't even know that we as writers exist. So <laughs> for those of us who have the gift of the, you know, telling stories and, and um, developing characters, we, feel, we, we know that we voice <coughs> you know, what the actors um, do. Um, so I basically got, a, basically got a chance meeting with Bill Cosby, and I basically ran up to him and said, I have this creative energy that has to be tapped, and he thought I was insane. <laughs> um, and then uh, he basically and he asked me what my goal was, and I told him that I, I wanted to write for television, that I'd you know, been writing most of my life, and people told me that I was amusing, so I figured it was so. And uh, he told me to go to law school. <laughs> he said, he said, go to law school, there ain't nothing for you out here. And then he actually told me that there were some lovely people that he knew that were philanthropists who'd be willing to help pay for me to go to law school. So then I'm thinking, what kind of an idiot am I not to take this opportunity? And yet, <laughs> the creative kept calling. So um, I took him some writing samples, and he actually was amused by them. And I told him I was willing to get coffee or sandwiches or whatever it took. I just wanted to get the exposure, and I felt like that was the moment I needed, that was the time when I needed to take advantage of maybe working for free and finding out whether this was the right path for me. Um, so I basically um, got set up by Bill Cosby, the other god of television mm -hmm. and comedy, um, as a writer's apprentice on the Cosby Show spinoff, A Different World. And I did get sandwiches, and I did take notes and lunch orders, and um, pick up my drunk boss from her pedicure manicure. <laughs> um, <laughs> I also was like $100,000 in debt after graduating from college, and I took a job that made me basically 94 cents an hour. Um, but during that first season, I just decided that um, I would try to kind of impose my voice wherever I could, and I ended up kind of co-creating the characters that became the center of the show. Um, and having you know just graduated from college and being on a show that was about college, I was able to basically use you know, the stories from my diary and the stories of my friends' lives and changing the names to protect the guilty and fuel, you know, so hundred and some odd episodes of that series. But it was about kind of having a voice, having a life experience, and having an ability to translate all of that onto the page. I mean, I kind of became the person who, when we needed us, when it was Wednesday and we needed a script on Monday, I was that person who would have to, would be the person sent off to do that. Um, I ended up writing, I became officially a staff writer on the show the second season and um, left there after the fifth season. So in four seasons, I ended up writing 25 episodes, which is quite a few. Um, well, so, but what I'm hearing that's really interesting in the uh, category of by any means necessary, it was you were willing to come out and, and forsake opportunities that were being given to you by Bill Cosby on the law side. And, and, and essentially work for free. Right, and I was a Stanford grad willing to get sandwiches right. I think to get that that's the exposure. A vitally important point. I know that, that that's pretty much, you know, I stuck around New York City until I was 29 years old before coming out here thinking that I was so brilliant that I could make tons of money as a screenwriter <laughs> not in L.A. That, that is not, or at least I, I'm not that brilliant. So I, I, I had to move at 29, I carried my computer onto the plane. It was so big in those days that I had to get an extra seat for it. And, and, uh, and, and got out here and uh, had borrowed like a grand from my father. I was totally broke. All my friends at 29 were like along their way in their jobs climbing the ladder and I, I felt like a, a loser. But, but, but once I got here, I realized there is a thriving business here. We turn on the TV, we look at the movies, somebody's making all this stuff. 
somebody's making a ton of money off of it. So, so you know, okay, how, how do you break in? One of the ways, it is a business of relationships, but not in that like creepy, nepotistic way. To be honest, I, I, I don't, most people are too embarrassed to give their idiot nephew a job. You know, it only reflects badly on them and they're too fearful of how that'll reflect on them. However, it is a business about hiring and rehiring the people who have delivered for you before. And when you're starting to break in, you need to be next to people who are doing it and getting paid. It is a business, I think, where mentors are vitally important. All businesses, I believe, mentors are important, but, but particularly in this one. And so I was at a party, and some producer started telling me what he was doing. And I said, oh, that sounds great. And I said, I'd love to be your assistant. And he said, oh, I have no money in my deal for an assistant. And I said, oh, no, I wasn't talking about money. I'll just be your assistant. And, and I suddenly was on the Paramount lot doing all the same things Yvette's talking about, scut work. But I was there, and I'm, I'm sitting at my window, and I'm on the Paramount lot, and the Star Trek aliens are walking past the windows on their way to the commissary. And I felt like I was in it. And even though I wasn't making a dime, I met people through doing his crap work who later on became executives or producers who I wrote scripts for down the line. So I, I think it's one of these things where I've always said, you got to have something that keeps the roof over your head, like the job, you know, some job. I had a million menial jobs, all of which I got fired from. But, uh, but, but, but you have to have something that keeps the roof over your head and then, and then the pursuit of your writing dream. And, and if you can marry the two together, like be an assistant on a television show, it's more difficult to get a job as an assistant on a TV show than it is to get a job as a writer these days. But, but the reason people go after go those far. jobs is because what you do is you spend all your day in a writer's room taking notes. You become friendly or indispensable to the showrunner. And Make an impact with your voice, with your point of view. I mean, I, I really agree with what yeah. Joe was saying about having an original voice because I've essentially made a career on my lone voice, mm -hmm. you know, going in and, and just being who I was to a different world. And then I actually, I left there and went to hang with Mr. Cooper where the room was filled with a bunch of people who didn't look anything like me. Um, and they didn't want to hear anything I had to say. And that was another kind of big break point for me, but it was a point that, it was a, a break that I had to create because I felt like if this is what Hollywood looks like, and this is what Hollywood acts like toward me, then I have to create my own opportunity. And I created a show called Living Single, which went on to be you know, a tremendous success. And that was my voice. And right. there have been several shows that have been like it since then. Um, but I've had a different quite. experience with voice, which was I just needed to get a paycheck. Like, I never even thought about having a voice. And frankly, it's only been, for me, it's well, only I just been... Well, I didn't want to lose my spot well, in the business. No, no. So I had to create my own spot. I mean, right. it wasn't even about, are they going to pay me $10 or $10,000? I just knew it wasn't going to keep happening within well, the, reason the I, usual the reason I, system. Well, the reason I bring it up is because, f uh, again, for me, if you were to ask me what my voice is now, after having done it for 15 years, I can look back on the scripts that I've written that have been the most well received and say, oh, this type of stuff is what, where you seem to ring the bell for people. You know? And so, so I, I have figured out more towards what my voice is mm -hmm. after having done it for a long time. But, but, but really, I think when finding your own voice, what the definition of that for people in here is to, to sit with yourself and, and, and think about the themes in your own life and in the world at large that interest you, what you're trying to say. What take you have on life? Is it light? Is it dark? Is it acerbic? Is it sentimental? What movies do you like? What, what are the tone of those movies? What television shows turn you on? You know, because television, Touched by an Angel works real well. It's not, it's not sexy, but it works, it's on the air forever. Maybe that's your voice, sentimental. Maybe it's dark and edgy like Sean Ryan's The Shield. But the point is this, to the, the discovery of one's voice doesn't just magically happen on the page. Again, for me, I just never even thought about having a voice until later on I looked back and said, okay, these are all the scripts I wrote that people just were like, eh. Oh, these were the two or three that people thought were off the charts. What's similar about those? Oh, okay. And another way to, to think of your voice is simply as your point of view. And your voice can change just as your point of view changes Indeed. on any subject. But also having clarity about that is, is really, I think, important and kind of propels you. Because people will also try to put you in a little niche. You know, if you've always written primarily women, they'll say, oh, she only writes women. I happen to write men really well. <laughs> I happen to be very in touch with my testosterone. You know, she only writes, you know, romantic comedy.
it's, you know, my, I was pitching, I was telling my husband about this other kind of spy piece that I'm working on, and he's like, is that what they're going to expect from you? Because they really kind of expect romantic mm -hmm. kind of related chick stuff from you. And I'm like, well, this is what they're going to get, because this is what I want to talk about right now. <laughs> you know, this is what's in me to tell. So as long as you're clear about that, um, I think you, you will, you have the, the ability to succeed. My, my point of view has totally changed. I now think investment banking is the best business in the world to be in. <laughs> in any case. Hedge funds. Um, uh, now, to John Bauman, and, and this, is, this is the big one. And then I'm going to jump right to Joe. I can't okay. You have labored for weeks, months, years. You have written a spec pilot, maybe a feature as a sample, an episode of a hot show, a nip talk, or what have you. You've shown it to friends, trusted advisors, writing coaches. You've rewritten it 15 times. It sings. It sings. You even give it to people who don't like you and don't have to say it's good, and they like it too. How do you get an agent to read it? How? John? Uh, you know, I've literally said to people, I would rather hear from your mother than from you. I, if anyone can recommend your material, you're better off than recommending it yourself. And, and you know, your mom may not be the most credible source. Uh, you know, but, and, and I don't know where you find those people, but if you don't have somebody who loves you enough to read your material and, and recommend it to their friend or whatever, then maybe you got to look at your material or your relationship. I, I, I think it's really important to get other people that are passionate about your material and even if they're just your friends or whatever but hopefully somebody's going to be honest with you I think you also have to recognize that I've certainly found that some of the things that I'm the most passionate about the material that I really really love doesn't hit across the board and then sometimes I know that means I've really got something great because if it's really great someone's going to hate it, it because it's going to be that much better so I, th I think that the, I think that the most important thing is is that you've been validated by people that are really passionate about this thing that you've read and can recommend it to somebody else. Very hard to get an agent to read something if you're the one putting it in front of them. If you're cold calling them or, say, or emailing them or whatever, that's just going to get deleted before, you know, before, they ever, uh, before they ever see it. So whoever, well, however... Well, you have to understand why. It's not because he's a jerk. I mean, he is a jerk, yeah. actually. But, <laughs> but that's not the reason I delete your emails. <laughs> it, it, it's this. It's think about it. Your job all day long is you're reading your client's scripts, your client's pilots. You're, you're coming in at 9. You're, if you're Joe, you're leaving at 4. But uh, the rest of them, they leave at 7.30. And basically, you're then taking home scripts to read for the next day. Over the weekend, it's pilot season. You're People are turning in pilots to the networks. You're reading 15 of those. You have two or three kids. You have a wife. You have to go on and exercise. In other words, it's a chore. I don't even read scripts like these guys do, but at this time of the year when we're staffing for a show, I have a stack. It's I've just finished a pilot. The last thing I want to do is have anything to do with the television business, and I get 200 <laughs> scripts to read. They take, if you read them carefully, you know, 45 minutes apiece, if you read them really carefully, or an hour. And, and so that's 200 hours. That's five straight weeks of a 40-hour week reading the specs if you were to read them all. Now, uh, uh, so, so what you guys have to understand is there is not this conspiracy to keep everybody out. Just keep you down. In fact, everybody <laughs> wants to find the next Ryan Murphy or the next big hitter voice that's going to create a hit show and get everybody all excited. Everybody wants that. The problem is not that many scripts that come in attain that level. And you do need a recommendation from somebody else to get one of these very busy people to say, you know what, I, I got to read this. I got to read this because maybe Joe, you know, I keep using Joe Slobotnik. That's actually Charlie Brown's favorite baseball player. But <laughs> in any case, um, uh, you know, it, it's about heat. It's a little bit about hype. Oh, gosh, ICM's looking at it. Well, then Joe and John better look at that script, too, because this might be a writer or the next big guy. But, but anyway. And I literally, I've, you know, I've said to I've said to my mom. I've said to the people in our in our feature department. Someone says, "I don't know much about television, but you know, but you might want to take a look at this." I say, "Have you read it? Do you like it? You've watched television. You can tell me whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. You know, it's. I mean, it doesn't really have to come from a professional to say to to give you that kind of recommendation. It can come from anyone. If someone says, "I read this and I really loved it," I'm going to read it. 
you know, I'll, I'll look at the first few pages anyway and see if I really get if I really get into it because somebody said I'm taking the time to put myself on the line this much for this person. Um, and uh, so it, I would say the number one thing is figure out who can recommend you, even if someone recommend you to somebody else, not necessarily an agent. But if you can hear, I mean, the best clients I've ever had have come because somebody said, hey, this was really great, or I hear this is really great. It's so, you know, it's so much better than saying it yourself. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say about relationships is, is you know, as Chris was saying, it's a business, and, and Joe was saying, you know, where people are in the room, it's very much a relationship-driven business, and, and, you know, writing fiction is like keeping a, a, a cement airplane in the air. You know, it's, if somebody has just the, says just the wrong thing at just the wrong time, everybody's believing that it's good. It's like, this is good, right? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. We're, and if you come in with any with uh, kind of that sort of negative attitude, which everybody's down, everybody gets insecure, everybody has bad days, but it's it's a really really tough thing to do, and it's and the hardest thing about this career that you've chosen is staying positive and staying up and believing in yourself and all that kind of stuff because it's an up and down business, and but that's very true even right now. So even in the little relationships with the Starbucks barista or, or whoever it is. That's that's part of building your building your career right now. So I'd say the most important thing in terms of getting an agent is get fans. Can I also um, add something to that? Meet John's mom. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to add that if you also if you're managing to get your script to someone and you're not getting the response that you hope to get kind of over and over and over again, I would encourage you to write another spec. Because I've seen people like just wither away after ten years of trying to push the same spec. And if you're really writers you write, writers write. So don't kind of, you know, put all of your, you know, efforts into one script and think that that's the thing that's going to get you in. And don't be discouraged by that one that doesn't get you in. Because well, we're the gonna next one, the second or the third one may be the one that grabs people's I attention. have some more questions to ask you on that very topic, and you too, Alan. But, uh, but, uh, but before we get off onto that subject, Joe. Uh, same question I just uh, I, I just asked John. So, so how, how do we get a guy at CAA to read this this great new piece of material that uh, that we've written here, I, I think like in storytelling, um, depending on whether you whatever you like, there's an element of surprise that turns you on about any kind of story. So I think that the same goes for get, finding um, advocates and representation. If you are crafty, which you have to be to move ahead in this business at any level, you will be like what Yvette said. You know, you have you know who you are. You may not know your full voice, but you're going to be approaching people, no matter if they're the lowest person on the totem pole, and sometimes that's the best person to contact, on any single show or network or studio or any contact that you may think you have. And there has to be an element of surprise. You have to, one, be cool enough and succinct enough to just, whether it's begging or getting somebody to say very clearly, this means a lot to me. Take a look at this. Just give me five minutes, read five pages or something. Any, any way you can distinguish yourself from somebody else to look at it, you know, in this era, it was amazing to me, um, you know, getting 300 some odd emails a day. You can't process all the information you have at your fingertips. With the internet and with all the access to information, it should be a lot easier to get in communication with anybody and to collect yourself and educate yourself about what are the ways in which to contact somebody who's associated with something that you really love and you think that you're right for, okay? And so, yeah, you're going to get turned down a zillion times because it's unsolicited. There's going to be somebody who breaks precedent and takes a look at something and remembers that, and then you get a, you get a relationship with them. And once you kick the door in, then you know what? You're going to see who that person's connected to, okay? If it's a lower-level executive at Touchstone or at ABC or at HBO or at Comedy Central, wherever it is, someone is going to take a look at that. I guarantee it. And I know, because when I was starting out, I know that I looked to half a dozen people that I developed a relationship with um, at various studios, at various networks, um, managers, lawyers, and we were all coming of age together, 23, 24 years old. And you start to get a sense of who that person is. You know, what are they like? Do you have the same kind of sensibility as they do? And you grow up with these people over a long period of time. So I'm running networks now. So in whatever you're, it doesn't, it's not, it's not about age to me. It's about craftiness and element of surprise in your storytelling and the innate ability to ferret out 
and go for a relationship with something that makes puts a little sweat on your brow and makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable at times because usually those kind of calls and those kind of experiences end up being very humbling but can push through and get you to the next level. Well, I think the thing you're saying that's really valid, it strikes me, is that it, it's, uh, and actually Robert McKee said this in his seminar, so I'm a little embarrassed to copy him, but the <laughs> fact of the matter is, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Joe and I used to run around at parties, you know, like chasing girls 15 years ago, and he's the head of the CAA department now. Half the guys we were at those parties with, uh, Riley's head of NBC, McPherson's head of ABC, these are all people that we were, just you know, and by the way, they were they were big, they were even bigger goofballs then than they are now. Uh, no, but um, I think that the uh, the thing is, it really is about being crafty and staying in there. I also like your idea, Joe, about trying rather than to get in touch with the head of CAA or a guy who's got a zillion clients. You know, you, you go to that person's assistant or, or or go to the lower level person on a television show and say, hey, I wrote a spec. I mean, again, it's very tough to sell a spec of Lost to Lost. That means somebody on Lost is going, you're better than me. You know, why don't we hire you instead of me? So, but, but, but the point is getting your material to uh, the appropriate person by, by any means necessary. The appropriate person that's in the, in the, at least the same zip code as what your interests are and what, you're, what you think your talents are. You know, I mean, I look back at some of the stories over uh, the time I've been there, and um, you know, there's a handful that stand out of, of wow, that, that's, that's – that was really smart on behalf of this writer, you know. Um, we handle a writer named Meredith Steam, who some people here may know of. She created Cold Case. She she got on Beverly Hills 90210 back in the day. By she was a, you know she's from University of Pennsylvania. She wrote musical plays, young adult coming of age stories, right time, right place, right show. Okay, she had a sophisticated voice. She wrote a spec NYPD Blue. I still remember. It's probably 12 years ago, because in that story. Um, she wrote a very, very emotionally uh, resonant, involving story about a group of fraternity guys who gang rape a girl. And basically all, none of them uh, will, you know, they're, they're putting a squeeze on them to try to reveal them. None of them, none of them will break rank. I remember this now, you know, 12 years ago, okay? And why? Because she wrote something as a woman or just as a writer, but as a woman writing about something like that, it was high, you know, it was, you couldn't help, you, you raced through the script. You could not wait to see what had happened. And that show, she got on NYPD Blue, they pulled that story, that A story, and put it into an episode of the show, which never happens. Never happens. As I'm sure Chris would tell you, as long as you've been doing this, almost never does that happen. So that's the unique case, okay? Mm -hmm. So, and then, you know, she went on to create Cold Case. What was, you know, some people think, ah, oh, it was generic, it's been on. You know, it's, everybody wanted a Cold Case idea. She presented that. It was about a strong woman. It was set in Philadelphia. She went to the University of Pennsylvania, okay? There's dotted lines throughout your whole career, like Yvette was saying, about stories that, where she had in college that are applied to the perfect medium on a show that she didn't create, but she helped evolve into something special because of what her voice was. And I think that, if you look at the long picture, the long road, that's what, you know, as any, rep any good representative is going to look for that, any good executive, any manager, any lawyer. It doesn't matter what level they're at. It doesn't matter, um, you know, kind of what their reputation is. If you check, you know, on Google, you know, or, or get, you know, the studio system, who their clients are. If you find somebody to connect to who can have a dialogue with that is in the entertainment business, okay, be it a music supervisor, a production assistant on something that you think is in your voice, you're going to win. But you have to think of it as a long-term play. You can't think of it like if you get turned down week, two, three, four weeks. You know, you don't want to go stalker on them, but you certainly have to have something that, you know, you can be remembered by. And that's what I look at. I, I, right now, I still, I was in New York all last week for the upper presentations, and, you know, I had a few meetings there. Um, one young writer who's only written short stories. Um, and why did I meet with this person? Because five other people said, this person's really brilliant. Okay, and I don't know what's going to happen with him, but I know what to do once I have the conversation to keep doing what he's already done. And um, you know, it, it, to me, it's it's as going back to the beginning. It's about your voice and about ultimately um, knowing what makes up successful television. Um, not thinking of it as as yourselves as creators yet, but for instance, to me, I, when I when I look at how I look at the writers I work with and the directors. 
particularly writers, you think in advising them, are you writing for the correct medium? Do you write about people trying to connect and bang into each other? Do you write with a lot of incident? Do you write things that are consistently meant to be people colliding and relationships breaking and trying to connect? Ultimately, I think that's ultimately what the small screen is about. Okay? If you write in a different fashion, if you write more lyrical, very filmic, if you write something, that's all good. But it may not be appropriate, it may, your voice may not be appropriate at that moment in time to write and have a successful career in television. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do that. But I'm very big on, on grinding people down to think, do you have something that connects to what successful television is? Drama, comedy, whatever it is, sketch, it does not matter. To me, when you look at that small screen, watch TV without the sound on. Watch TV without the sound on. Look at, ha look at what happens. Can you still look at the story being told? There's so many little things that you pick up for doing this for a long time that, you, that, that you, you need to think about when you're starting to, you know, get there and think, what do I want to do? And those are the things that I advise emerging writers to do is, is think, am I in the right pursuit, first and foremost? Okay, because those are the things that, to me, make up successful television. And whether you're writing a spec office, spec Grey's Anatomy, those are things that are absolutely relevant. You'll be struggling if you don't think of those things, to me. You've given me a lot to think about, Joe. Yes. <laughs> Are we pursuing uh, the right thing? <laughs> okay. That's what I think about. <laughs> Another quick question or two for the panel, but then I'm going to open up the floor because I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions. Uh, we're, we're done at 4? Is that 4 o'clock? No. 4 o'clock. Okay. Uh, all right, advocates, representatives, people who are assistants at agencies or studios, people who are PAs or first ADs, in other words, people connected to the business who read your work, love it, and then they know a friend who knows two friends, and boom, 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 all of a sudden it's in the hands of somebody, most likely whose boss can buy the project. Let, 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 let's say all that happens. But again, those advocates are hard to find, and, and uh, w what do you guys think, both writers and agents here on the panel, about a manager helping out? Now, a manager is, it seems to me, easier to get in some cases than an agent, and, and, and some managers are absolutely legitimate and have uh, huge client lists. Others seem to me to operate on the very fringes of the business and, and, and aren't necessarily as well connected as they may, may have you think. But um, what's, what's your guys' opinion, collectively, on the notion of uh, beginning writers having a manager who helps try to kick down doors, et cetera, et cetera, of course, in return for 10 or 15 percent or whatever they charge? Um, very quickly, let's just go down the line and get a quick response. Well, uh, I, I always have to start. <laughs> I, I never had a manager. And I, I mean, I've been working in TV since 1981. I, I never had a manager, but I, if somebody likes your work and wants to help get you a job, I, I can't see how that could be a bad thing. But maybe somebody who knows more about the difference between managers and agents, like an agent, <laughs> will be more articulate about this. Joe? I think whatever, it's how you value your money. You know, it's yep. how you value your, your, your um, investment in your future. Uh, if people, whoever they are, respond to your work and they can prove that they are honest and hardworking and will do something to help you with your material, first and foremost, because I think you need a sounding board of someone who's going to be honest with you. The first sign that I see where there's a problem is when people say, you know, all my friends read this and love this. Uh, I say, give it to somebody who's not your friend, who's going to be honest with you. Because um, most of the time, I think it's very challenging for someone to have an honest conversation about material and then know how to help you get it to the place where it needs to be. If the manager is somebody who can help you do that and be truthful with you about where you stand, hallelujah, bring it on. And it's and as you value that extra 10% in your in, at any stage in your career, I'm all for it. You know, I, I have no issue with that. There are certain people that I like to work with more than others. Um, there are certain people that go to that extra place and work incredibly hard. Um, my advice is to to anybody I'm working with, I'll work with anybody. I don't care how many people. As long as we're all working in lockstep, it's totally good with me, and it's I'm never going to comment that you. I think it's silly to spend an extra 10 percent. If that's what gives you a comfort zone and you don't have a problem with me, we're good. good. Bill, um, I I too have never had a manager, but I think it's a simple question of mathematics for the people in this room who are trying to break in. Better to be paying 25 percent of something 
than 10% of nothing. So if there are, if you find someone who you trust and who believes in you and who will fight for you, whether they're a manager or an agent, if you're lucky enough to have both, I, su I, I, suppose, um, I suppose that's a good idea. Okay. Beth? I'd rather spend my money on shoes than my <laughs> 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 Can you choose when you? Uh, I, the only thing I would say is, listen, I, I've had great experience with managers and bad experiences with managers, and I find personally what Joe and I do is a very specific very specific kind of a business, the TV uh, staffing and, and uh, developing television shows. And so if you are talking to a manager, you want to work in television, make sure they know the television business. Right. Uh, un unless you're looking for a manager to only handle the feature side of what you're doing or something like that. But uh, in my experience, it's, it's pretty frustrating to work with somebody who not only doesn't know anybody, but also doesn't know the business. Doesn't know, doesn't know the right. business. And there I would say you are definitely throwing your money away. Uh, but there are, there are managers who know what they're doing, as Joe says, will work really hard, and, and uh, they, can, they can certainly add value. And I think that, uh, so again, you have to be careful about who those people are and make sure they're actually earning their money. Uh, and at the same time, from what I've heard from, from some of these panelists, is that you know part of your job as a writer is, uh, I've never had a manager because I always thought, well, I handle the managerial aspects of my career. In other words, I'm very comfortable strategizing and game planning, figuring out who the players are, understanding how the business works. That's part of the reason we put on this panel today and started it off with an overview of how these studios and networks actually bring shows to air. Because I'm always surprised when I speak to artists, meaning writers or actors or even directors, and I start to talk to them about the business and I realize, oh my God, you've got a product you're trying to sell in a business. Make no mistake, this is a business. It's all fun when, you know, it sounds real fun, but it's a business it's about making money. And I'll be amazed at how the writers or actors I speak to are absolutely clueless about how the business works, about how people make money in this business. And I'm not just talking about us as writers selling a script and getting X amount of money. I'm talking about how the business operates economically and who the various decision makers are. And so my advice to all of you is as you take this career seriously, as you take it as a marathon, not just a quick sprint to one magical million dollar spec. Because uh, trust me, that, that, that money, if you sell a spec, uh, goes, goes faster than you can believe, and then you've still got 30 years of a career ahead of you. You know, nobody remembers the spec you just sold a, as a lucky break. And, and frankly, when I came to town, there was a million dollar spec that sold every week. Now, yeah. now you never hear about that. The business really has changed over the years. So whether you have a manager or not, I think one thing to keep in mind is be, be your own manager to some degree. You know, re the reading the trades is helpful. At first, it's like reading a text in ancient Aramaic. <laughs> and, but then as you start to read it day after day after day, you know, you learn that when someone ankles a job, it means they've been fired. And, 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 and you start to see, you know, you start to see more about how the business works and who the players are. Uh, you also have to fight to make sure the trades don't become a, an entirely, like, depressive thing in your life. I used to call.